very difficult to speak phenomenally and to not be good. Come on, y'all from yesterday. Not be great, but to be what? Unfreaking forgettable. It's difficult to be unforgettable while you're still trying to look good. <laughs> you can't do two things as chasing two rabbits. See, unforgettable has everything to do with serving at a level so high, so big, so massive that people feel like they have to change their lives because they crossed your path. Yes, yes. Yes, yes. Yes, yes. See, see when you're willing to use your voice. First, you have to recognize that you have one. You got to recognize that that no matter your past, you were given a voice and your voice was given not to keep to yourself. Your voice is not a secret, says the secret teacher. (laughs) And you have to be willing to use every experience that's ever happened in your life, not as a fortress holding you from using your voice, but as the fuel on why you will use your voice. You got to be willing to not stand in your story, but stand on your story. Yes, yes. It's not in spite of your past that you get to be amazing, that you get to be a change agent, that you get to transform lives. It's because of your past that you're perfect for such a job. Hi. When you own it like that, see, there's no question in my certainty about my life. Can you walk with that level of certainty so that when the wind comes and then when the wind blows and it will come and it will blow and it will be a storm and it will be a tornado and it will look like divorce and it will look like bankruptcy and it will look like an illness and it will look like a loss. When it comes, it will rock you. It will rock you. It will rock you, but it won't move you. Humans are built to serve. If you are not happy, it's because you do not feel like you are serving people. If you wake up and you're not happy, you feel like today doesn't matter, today doesn't count, nobody cares if you show up or not, that's the path down to anxiety and stress and depression and suicide because you feel like you don't belong because it feels like you could spend all day working on something and nobody's going to care. That's the feeling that nobody wants, right? You don't want to wake up and feel like you're going to spend all day today and nobody will care. How do you get people to care? By serving, by helping. We all want to wake up and feel like today is going to count. It's going to mean something to somebody. And maybe today is the big day that you get that big news or the big deal or the big contract or the big subscriber goal or whatever your goals are. Maybe it's that day. But those goals aren't enough. How many times have you hit a goal and realized, oh, that's it? Right? You feel great? Have that happened to you? Like, oh, I got a million subscribers. Wah! And then, then what? What does that mean? And it's off to the next goal. If you're just living for the little sugar highs, you're not having happiness at the foundational level in your life because you don't feel like you're serving. We have to tie the work that we do into serving. It's feeling like today is going to mean something. If you woke up today and felt like today was going to mean something, today was going to matter, that I'm going to put something out into the world, I'm going to make this YouTube video, I'm just sitting here in my office or standing on my trampoline in my office, that I'm going to make something today that will matter, that will touch somebody. If I felt that, I'm going to show up totally differently than like, oh, whatever, another video. Okay, who cares? You know, record. Hey, Evan. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Next, right? You just show up differently based off your feeling about yourself that you're doing something that's going to serve people. So if you're struggling with that and you're, you're coming up with your list of goals and you've got your dream board and you've got your Lamborghini and your vacation home and an airplane and a fancy hotel, those are not the things that will make you happy. Those are not your real goals. That's a fake dream board. The thing that will make you sustainably happy is feeling like you're serving and the next level of it is either serving more deeply or more broadly. You take the people who are closest to you and you really focus on helping them and and help improve their lives in a significant way, or you're going to reach a lot more people. But if you're not happy, it's because you're not serving. So how do you do it? How do you, how do you serve at a higher level? I'm going to give you three quick ideas that I think will help. Number one, there's a process I go through. It's called who I have. So number one is your who, your who is your single most important core value. 
What is your single most important core value? I write about this in, in Built to Serve. You can go check it out if you want. Your single most important core value. What is it? For me, it's belief. For you, it's, it, maybe it's belief too, but maybe it's a good chance that it's something else. But your single most important core value. As you go through it, I found that it's funny how everybody's core value is something positive. This is why I believe people are good because I've never had somebody's core value come back as hate or death or be toxic, right? Never. It's always something aspirational and positive, which means that people are good. We do things that we're not proud of. We, we sometimes are negative to others because we're in a lot of pain at that moment. But deep down at a core level, humans are good. So you figure out your single most important core value. What is it? Don't worry about being perfect. Just even right now, what comes to mind? What, what single word is really important to you right now? A core value. Great. How you can serve is to bring more of that to yourself and then to bring more of that to other people. The ultimate service for me is believing more in myself so then I can believe more in other people as well. The goal of making these videos is to help you believe in yourself more, to help the world believe in themselves more, to unlock the Michael Jordan level genius that we all have inside of us, that you're the best in the world at something. What is it? I don't know. I hope you do, but if not, let's discover it and send it out to the world. Your ultimate happiness, satisfaction, joy, fulfillment will yes come from serving other people, but in, for me, believing in them. If I could help, even through this video or conversation or a clubhouse or a live session, if I knew that I was gonna say something that would help even one person on the call believe in themselves a little bit more, mission accomplished. So adding clarity, you know you wanna serve, you know if you're not happy, you're not serving, great. How? The first level of clarity is your who, your single most important core value. Figure out what that is, even if you have a starting point or being perfect, the more that you can help yourself and others believe that thing, the more happy you will be. Next level down is your why. So point number two is your why. Your why is your purpose and your purpose comes from your pain. So whatever you struggled the most with is the thing you wanna help other people through. It's great to hold the door for somebody or buy the coffee behind in line or, or buy somebody a balloon or give a sandwich to somebody who's you know hungry. Like all of those things are great, it's great. These momentary acts of kindness are fantastic, amazing, do more of them. What will fill you up on an even deeper level is recognizing that your ultimate purpose, your why, comes from helping people who currently are who you used to be. Go back to the moment in your life where you felt the, the lowest, the loneliness, the least, uh, the least level of confidence you've ever had in yourself. When did you feel worthless as a human? What was that moment? Hopefully it's not right now. It's probably not right now if you're watching these videos because you're, you're on your way up. Go back to when you would never watch one of these videos. Go back to when it was just the worst day of your life. When was that for you? You've come through. You're not done. You're not done climbing, growing, learning, getting better. You're still a long way from where you want to be. And that's amazing. And you're way further than you used to be. Your why, your purpose is to help the people who currently are who you used to be. They'll look to you and see guidance, hope, encouragement, support, inspiration, motivation, because you're ahead of where they are right now. The you from five years ago would look to you and be inspired, right? The, the Evan from five years ago, from 10 years ago. Look at 10 years, 10 years ago on YouTube, I had, I don't know, 100 subscribers. He's trying to make 10 year goals. I would never predict that I'd be here. 10 years ago, Evan is looking to Evan today. He's like, you did all that? Oh my gosh, it's crazy. But we never pat ourselves on the back and give ourselves enough credit for those things. And there are millions of people right now who are struggling with the same thing. Whatever you struggled with, there are millions of people who are struggling with that same thing right now. And they need you. They need your voice. They need your help. They need support. They need your guidance. They need your encouragement. They need your words. They need you. They need you. And helping those people will feel so much better than just doing a random act of kindness. It's just levels of service, right? Random act of kindness, great. Little candy, but deep fulfillment will be from helping the people who currently are who you used to be. That's your why. That's your purpose. It will never get old. You'll love doing that for the rest of your life. And then step number three is the how. The how is how did you get out of the hole you were in? What were the steps that you took? 
So for me, getting out of the hole that I was in, where I, the worst day of my life was quitting on my business partner in my first company, how to get out of the hole while well, I modeled success. And I tried a million different things, you know, and the modeling success was just a, a, a desperation play. You know, like, okay, oh my gosh, I don't know what else to do. Who, who else has done this? Bill Gates started a software company. What did he do? I felt like I was grasping at straws. Like I had no idea what I was doing. It was just an idea that came to me and I was willing to try anything at that point because the other alternative was just to quit on my company and go find a job. Now, luckily, that was the one that actually ended up working out. And now anytime when I don't know what to do something, I try to model success. Like who's done this thing and how can I learn from them instead of having to reinvent the wheel every time. And so what have I done for the past 20 years? Oh my gosh, 20 years. What have I done for the past 20 years? Teach people how they can model success too, right? The how matters, how you got out of the hole that you were in, you can then teach other people what worked for you. You tried all these things that didn't work and you almost gave up. And then you found something that did kind of work and then you worked on it and you improved it and you refined it. That is now teachable to other people. Show them the process to get out of the hole because they don't see any hope and they think they're stuck for life. And your story, your message will help pull them out in a way that Evan Carmichael can't, in a way that Lisa Nichols can't, in a way that Tony Robbins can't, in a way that anybody can't, but you can because you are exactly the person that they need to hear from because you've gone through exactly the problem that they are struggling with. Your who, your why, your how. It's all in built to serve. That's your path. If you're not happy, it's because you're not serving. You feel like today doesn't matter and doesn't mean anything to anybody else. And you flip that just by reminding yourself of who you are, of why you do what you do, and how you got out of the hole so you can feel like today will mean something to somebody else. And that if you keep showing up consistently every day and putting in the work, the impact that you will have on this planet will inspire you to a level that you can't even imagine right now. You are built to serve. Also, to make sure you're actually taking action after watching this video, I've designed a special free worksheet just for this video. The worksheet will highlight all of the lessons learned in this video, as well as pull out our three favorite learnings and quotes that will inspire you to actually do something. The worksheet will also give you space to write down what your key takeaways are and your specific plan of action to make sure you're getting results. If you want the worksheet designed specifically for this video, absolutely for free, there's a link in the description below. Go click on it and start building the momentum in your life and your business. I'll see you there. Oh my God, I love this question. I don't think I've ever been asked this question before. I have never had an opportunity to explain it. Being the best version of you. First of all, it's not don't think of it holistic. I want you to break it down to different parts of your life because when you are committed to being the best version of you, which in summary, it's the you that you're so incredibly proud of holistically. It's a 360 approach. It says, I'm not perfect. So best does not mean the perfect version of you. Because I think perfection and balance are two illusions that are designed to help you keep chasing something that's not even attainable. So perfect is not attainable and balance is not attainable. So it's perfectly managing my imperfection and releasing balance and having harmony, number one. But the best version of you is really saying that in each area of my life, I'm in movement. In each area of my life, I'm in evolution. In each area of my life, I'm active. I am actively participating in an upwardly way, in an upwardly mobile way in this area of my life, times every area of my life. It doesn't necessarily mean that there, you're always where you wanna be, but it does mean that you're being responsible, you're being active, and you're being proactive. Finances, that you're looking at your numbers just this morning, just this morning, I ran my credit score again. I want to see what's on it. I want to be actively participating in my financial growth. I looked at my savings. I looked at my life insurance. I, I just looked at my, my long-term plan. Not necessarily because I want to buy another house or I want to buy a car. I just want to be on top of it. 
I want to be responsible for. And then health and wellness. Just yesterday, I was talking to Matt and going, Matt, it's time for us to do another health and wellness campaign. I don't necessarily want to do it. And it slightly to moderately scares me a bit when I'm bringing my fitness into a public conversation, but I know the responsible me, the best version of Lisa is saying, hold me accountable. Hold me accountable to my fitness goals. Hold me accountable to my total wellness goals. And then last week I was just sitting with someone saying, you know what? I need to go down the list of all the checkups that I've had. I need to make sure I'm not missing anything. Relationships. I just said to a girlfriend yesterday, hold me accountable. Hold me accountable to not running. I realize that I run well and I run smoothly. I run like a gazelle sometimes when it comes to relationships. You don't, it doesn't even look like I'm running because I'm so busy. So I asked someone who knows me, who knows the love that I want, who knows my sexy excuses, I need you to hold me accountable. When I say this, I want you to question it. And so while there's so much growth in every area of my life, I'm being the best version that I know to be because I'm active in every single area. I'm not saying I'm being the best or I am the best. Please don't get me wrong with that. I'm just saying to be the best version of myself. So when you look at being the best version of yourself, look at each part of your life and go, what am I actively doing? Where you feel like I'm in the game in this area. I'm not resigned and I'm not praying for it to go right. Or I'm not in resignation and in complaint about it. I'm not a victim to that relationship. I'm not a victim to my finances. I'm not a victim to the relationships in my family. I'm an active part of creating what's occurring. And it can always get better, but I'm an active part. That's being the best version of you. And waking up each morning and saying, I like me today. I got many things I can work on, but I like me today. Before you ever go out on Facebook or any other social media platform to check to see if anyone else like you, your job is to like you first. And every other like is bonus. That's stepping into the best version of you. Setting long-term goals that make your knees knock a little bit and make your teeth chatter a little bit. Those goals that you don't know exactly how you're going to get it done, but it's something that you want to get done. It doesn't, it stretches you, but it doesn't stress you. Your goals are supposed to stretch you, not stress you. Those things, that combination. And when you live in that capacity and you focus and you operate in that one, that's when you're living and being the best version of you. If you find that the relationships around you have toxic outcomes, then I want you to look at where's the breakdown. Is the breakdown in communication? Is the breakdown in how you communicate, the words you're using? Is the breakdown in who you choose to be around? Is the breakdown in the engagement of what you're talking about? What I've learned is that if you're not talking about things that are high enough and big enough, things that are inspiring enough, you will slip into the smallness every single time. If you don't choose an intentionally high, evolving, encouraging conversation, you will slip into the cracks. You will slip into those crevices of smallness and petty. And until you get people trained that you're going to live up here without telling them, I need you to know, it's not an announcement. It's a way of being. It's a what do you choose to participate in. It's a stepping over your desire to hear smallness, uh, gossip, um, uh, negative feedback. It's when someone is engaging in negative feedback about someone else, the fact that you didn't add anything to the conversation doesn't let you off the hook. Did you stop the conversation? Did you say, hold on, I don't want to engage in speaking negatively of them at all. Why don't you have a conversation with them? It's course correcting behaviors in your space at the risk, at the risk of losing the relationship. But what you basically do is is you say, here's where I play. Here is where I live. I'm not visiting this high road of integrity. I'm not visiting this high road of conscious thinking and awareness and respect and humility and, and honoring the dignity in people. I don't visit this place. I live here. I don't visit this place. I live here. And in a loving way, anyone that's engaging with you has two choices. They either engage with you here or they choose to engage with someone else. Now, if you find that you're going down 
to be in the relationship or you're going down and you're taking and you're the person taking the relationship down because you're in a moment of anger or you're in a moment of resentment or you're in a moment of hurt, then you're not living in your highest integrity. You just visit every now and again when you come to this channel. Uh-oh, I see my, my, my Shantae coming out right now. Shantae is my middle name. It's what I do when I start getting real edgy because I really want you to get it. So you need to make a decision on where you choose to reside. And then you don't leave your conscious neighborhood to go visit other people's neighborhood if it's not as high as yours. People will rise to the occasion or they'll choose not to rise and they'll pick other people to be with and hang with. And I know that sounds easier said than done because some of the people who are playing at a lower level might be in family. It might be, and that's fine too. You can love people. It doesn't mean you have to spend tons and tons and tons of time if that time costs you something. Spend as much time as you can. Spend as much time as serves you. Spend as much time as they will allow you to spend. But never leave this place. Even if being with them causes you to, to allow them to be where they are, you don't have to engage in that. So the bottom line and supporting you to either recognize are you the toxic element or are you surrounding yourself in toxic element is to make a commitment where you live where am i living and first own where you're currently living because if you own it you might go you know what i do slip into that small place okay own it that's conscious awareness that's powerful own it and then go where do i want to be and then what's the distance between here and there and what do i have to do to get there what do i have to say no to what do i have to participate in what do I have to ask forgiveness for? What do I have to clean up? What relationships require cleaning up? And then what declarations must I make? And what decisions must I live in? Don't make a decision, live in your decision. My nephew was sitting on my great uncle Leonard's lap. And my great uncle Leonard, he smoked cigars for like every year of my life. And I at the time was like 19 and I never saw him without a cigar. So uncle Leonard smelled like a what? a really old cigar. <laughs> and everyone knew Uncle Leonard smelled like a cigar, but no one had the courage to tell Uncle Leonard that he smelled like a cigar. You guys, everybody has had an Uncle Leonard somewhere in your life, right? Because Uncle Leonard was my grandmother's brother, so he had clout. Well, Jamil was three, so he didn't know. He, he, he hasn't been introduced to being politically correct yet. Thank God, right? So uh, Jamil is sitting on my Uncle Leonard's lap and we're all talking and Jamil stops in the middle of a sentence and he goes. <laughs> and the first time he sniffed, we, no big deal. But the second and the third time. <laughs> then in his little three-year-old voice, Uncle Yannard, you tink. <laughs> And you can hear a pin drop in the room. Oh. And everyone in that moment was grateful that they were not Jamil's mother. <laughs> and we all gazed at her. Bad mom, bad mom. The next thing that fell out of Uncle Leonard's mouth shocked us all. He looked at Jamil with a long gaze, kind of not knowing what's about to happen gaze. And he said, Jamil? I think you're right. I think I tink. <laughs> For the first time in my entire life, Uncle Leonard put out his cigar. And the next time we saw Uncle Leonard, it smelled like he had just been washed for days. <laughs> he was always clean, but his clothes just smelled like old cigars. And it was very clear that he got new clothes. See the freedom that a child has the truth that they stand with. Think like a child. Don't act like a child, but think like a child. Be as free as a child. See, children have a sense of curiosity. Children forgive sooner, quicker, faster. And if you want something new to come out of your voice, you have to put something new in you in terms of a commitment. My son, like I, I would watch the way he would forgive me. And he did something wrong one day and I had to reprimand him and I immediately felt guilty and I'm in my office. He's like four years old and I'm on my, on my computer and I'm crying because I'm single mother guilt, entrepreneur. 
And I'm like, and he comes around the corner. He goes, mommy, and I just reprimanded him. He's on a timeout and all this stuff. And I'm upset. I'm crying. He's okay. <laughs> and he comes around the corner and I'm, and he says, mommy, mommy. I was like, yes. Do you want to lay down with me? Yes. <laughs> and he goes and he lays out this little skinny arm and I put my big old head on that arm. <laughs> There's something that happens when we allow ourselves to sit inside freedom, sit inside transparency, sit inside what I like to call care frontation. Hmm. That means I might push up against you a little bit. I might make you mildly to moderately to significantly uncomfortable in any form of mediocrity. But it's out of the spirit of love. You want to inspire people with your voice from your child to your sibling, to your significant other, to your community, to the world, to this room. Be willing to love me enough to tell me your truth. Then love me enough to tell me my truth. Then love me enough to just tell me the truth. And, and find, find, be willing to touch the edge of your own comfort zone. You show me yours, and I'll show you mine. You show me your heart, and I'll show you my love. You let me know that you're willing to be imperfect and still have a perfectly giving, serving, loving life, then you give me permission to let my imperfection out into the world too. See, you want to speak at another level? You got to be willing to love at another level, forgive at another level, show up at another level, speak up at another level, pray at another level. You have to be willing on every level to up level who you be on a daily basis. I love to go back and share some of my favorite memories with you, my fondest. And what I realized, they're actually my most moving memories. One happened over 12 years ago. I was in Toronto, Canada with Margaret. And this gentleman walked up to me, standing about six foot two, Caucasian man in his mid forties. And he looked at me and he goes, Lisa, I have a problem with you. I said, you do? And my heart started to beat. I'm like, oh my God, someone doesn't like me. What did I say wrong in their eyes? And what, how is this going to play out? And he goes, I have a problem. I, have a, I really have a problem. And I said, okay, how can I help you? He said, I'm an atheist. I don't believe in God. I'm fine not believing in God. I'm comfortable. I prefer not to believe in God. I don't believe that there's a God. And I said, okay, what's your problem? He said, my problem is, I love you. I love everything about you. I love the energy you come with. I love the way you speak. I love what I feel when I'm listening to you talk. He said, and you keep referring to this God as your source. And I don't believe in God. So that's my problem. And I said, sir, I'm sorry. I'm not sure where your problem lies. I said, if if you don't believe in God, you have that right. If you love me, I'm excited because you can feel that I love you too. And he looked at me and he goes, so let me get this straight. This is not the part where you try to convert me or try to tell me how wrong I am or you try to explain to me about your God so that I can begin to believe like you believe. This is, this is not that part, you're not gonna do that? And I looked up at him, I said, why would I do that? You're committed to whatever you believe in. My job is to honor your belief system. And he goes, see, you're doing that thing again that's making me love you more. That's my problem. But I know you believe in God. I said, that's not a problem. Why don't you keep believing in me and loving me? I'll keep believing in God and loving God. And we'll keep having this great experience. After I said that, he just grabbed me. And he hugged me. And he held me. And I knew somehow he was holding on to possibility. That's what I choose to tell myself. He was holding on to the love that he could feel for me, the palatable, non-judgmental, non-persecuting love. And in that moment, 
I couldn't feel more joy. As I held that man, I couldn't feel more joy. I, I, I couldn't feel more happiness that this is what ministry is about. This is what touching souls is about, is, is to love the person who thinks that you might not love them because their belief system. It was just so beautiful. The moment was so beautiful. I mean, he held me. And then he drew back and looked at me. And he said, you're the real deal. And I looked up at him and I said, so are you. And we said our goodbyes. I never saw him again. Margaret and I went up to the room, our hotel room that night and replaying what happened we both just started to bawl, just cry. And I said to Margaret, Margaret, this is Marketplace Ministry disguised as a business. I'm not in the converting business. I don't need to convert anybody. You're exactly where you choose to be. But I am in the loving business. My job is to love you where you are. And that beautiful gentleman, that day, he reminded me and Margaret, I believe, what unconditional love could feel like. To set healthy boundaries, you can't just make an announcement. I've been looking at the Lisa Nichols show, and I know you won't say it like that, but things have got to change. No, don't announce it like that. Don't announce it with that, what I call that stank energy on it. Don't announce it with that negative, I'm done, you've been using me. You, no, 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 again, they simply have signed up for the game that you created, the relationship that you created, which was, I'm going to give, you can receive, you don't ever have to worry about crossing a boundary with me. So the first thing you need to do is to set the record straight by apologizing to the people that you've allowed to cross your boundaries. You have to say, I apologize. Just say it just like this. Just quote me. Just, just like this. You don't have to say, you quote me. Just you can, It's your own words. You can modify it as need be. But you know what? I owe you an apology. I owe you an apology because I've made you think that I have no boundaries. I've led you to believe that I don't need rest. What I've done is I've, I've overused my yes. And so I'm not used to saying no, and you're not used to hearing no from me. I've even said yes to you when I needed to say no. And what I know about you is that you would want me happy. So I apologize. I set something in motion that doesn't even work for me. I love you. I know you love me and I love the relationship, but I need to make some tweaks. I did this. Don't do it in any passive aggressive way that indirectly blames them. No, own your stuff. You are a leader. Own your mess. Own your choices. Own the results. I had to do it. Hold on. I set everyone up to believe that I can handle everything. I kind of like being the hero of the story. It was my ego or my self-esteem that needed to be fed for the last 10 years. And now I've grown up enough to realize I don't need that. And so in this new season, I need to set healthier boundaries. It's not about you. You never saw my line. So you didn't know that you were crossing it. You never saw the boundaries, so you didn't know where they, they existed. That's on me. Ooh, now that's grown folk talk. That's grown folk talk. That's adult. That's emotional literacy at its best. So I know it might make your knees knock. It might make your teeth chatter. But pull up your big boy pants, pull up your big girl pants, and make it happen. Because on the other side of that is the experience that you deserve and the one that you're looking for. But it first requires you to do the work. In a previous episode, I talked about your Popeye muscle. That's the thing you've been doing for a long time already. That's the letting everyone cross your boundaries. That's the saying yes to everyone. And then there's that olive oil muscle. You know, the muscle that hangs down here because it's underdeveloped. That's that setting healthy boundaries muscle. That's that apologizing for how you've shown up and allowed other people to not even see your boundary. That's owning it. Oh, yeah, I know. It can be intense, but it's so incredibly beneficial. So let's do it. Let's reclaim your boundaries. Let's reclaim your joy. Let's reclaim your life. Let's reclaim your future. Let's reclaim and design it in a way that serves everybody. Because when you do this, you will model for those who are witnessing you. You will model. People won't choose to be out of relationship with you because you apologize for never setting boundaries. It'll be a little disruptive. It'll be a little uncomfortable. It'll be a little new. And then they'll settle in it. 
and then we know something new. And then you've inspired others to do the same. Let me first explain to you what forgiveness isn't. Because most people won't forgive because they have an incorrect understanding of what forgiveness is. So forgiveness is not pardoning someone's behavior. It's not excusing someone's behavior. Forgiveness isn't admitting that you were wrong. Forgiveness isn't saying what was done to me is okay. Forgiveness isn't any of those things. Forgiveness actually, if you really understand it, it has less to do with the other person and more to do with you and more to do with your future. Let's go back to the oil and water scenario. So forgiveness invites in love, invites in possibility, invites in prosperity, it invites in new thinking, it invites in creativity. So forgiveness is an expanding emotion. When you forgive, you're opened up for new things. Anger is a contracting emotion. It requires you to shut down, to avoid, to shut out, to stop talking. Everything in anger is about stopping and shutting down. Everything about forgiveness is about opening up without pardoning someone's behavior. I want to make sure I'm clear on that because most people attach forgiveness to, but you don't know what he did, but you don't know what she did. When you can detach, forgiveness is not about what they did. Forgiveness, get this, forgiveness is about making yourself available. Think about you. your body is primary real estate. There's only so much of it. It's a finite, it's a finite space. There's only so much space. It's not forever, but it, this is your body. This, so if this is your primary real estate, if this is your primary real estate, your heart, and you're, you have anger occupying 20% of it, you can never experience 100% love. You can never experience 100% possibility. You haven't given yourself a chance at 100% of the things you want most because your primary real estate, your heart, your body, your mind is being occupied with a very intrusive, toxic emotion. Less and less about them. Nothing to do with them being right or their behavior being pardoned or the action. It's your, your future is paying for your past when you hold on to anger. So when you get really connected to the cost of anger, then it's not about the what. A matter of fact, the longer you've been angry, the longer you robbed yourself of 100% of what you were, were worthy of. And if someone's betrayed you, if someone's hurt you, then you over everyone deserve 100% love, 100% possibility, 100%, but it requires forgiveness. And in many cases, it's forgiveness of yourself. In many cases, the person you've been angry at the longest is yourself. And the same rule applies when it comes to you. Acknowledge your community. See, when you celebrate the people around you that bring you joy or that teach you some of the hardest lessons that you need to learn, the iron that sharpens the iron, the celebrators that celebrate you, those who hold the space for you and with you, pray for you, honor you, when you celebrate and lift them up, the whole tide rises. So I want you to find six people in your community, not out of obligation, but truly out of choice. They can be in your circle, in your family, in your business circle. And I want you to acknowledge them for the contribution that they bring to your life. What I love about acknowledgement is that when you acknowledge other people, it actually makes you happier. It's just this amazing gift of giving. And what I love is that most people would rather get an acknowledgement from you than a physical gift. That means they don't necessarily need the perfume, they don't need the sweater, they don't need the new iPhone, whatever. They want you to look at them in their eyes and say, you bring value, you bring value to my life. I honor you, I celebrate you, I appreciate you. Take time to have a personal moment with them where you're just seeing them. The number one reason why people feel sad and disconnected is because they say they don't feel seen. So in this acknowledgement, I want you to look into their eyes and acknowledge them for who they are and how they make your life 
better. When you raise the community around you, the entire tide rises, the energy rises, the joy rises, the expectation rises, and guess what? If you make this a part of your weekly habits with them, I didn't say daily, I didn't say monthly either, and I definitely didn't say annually, but if you make this a part of your weekly, find one thing to acknowledge at least six people in your community for each week. One, you'll feel, like, you'll feel much more excited, but all of a sudden there's a vibration that happens because you've created it. There's this energy of let's go do this because what gets celebrated gets repeated. You want someone to repeatedly do something wonderful and amazing in your life, you repeatedly acknowledge them from a genuine place. Man, it's so powerful when you truly marry yourself to the acknowledgement process, to the practice of acknowledgement. When you get into the practice of acknowledgement, all of a sudden people will mirror back to you. You don't acknowledge to get it back. You acknowledge because you want people to be seen. But there's just this, this dance that begins to occur that's absolutely delicious. You know, over my career, and I've been in business over 20 years now, uh, people from all around the world, students at every level, whether they are newly into launching their business or they've been in business themselves for 10, 15 years, ask the question, how do I overcome fear? I'm about to disrupt you completely because I am not going to give you a strategy to overcome fear. Because if I even attempt to give you a strategy, and I know we're always looking at stuff, reading things, how to overcome fears. There are probably 10 steps to overcoming fear somewhere out there. They weren't written by me. And I could never write it. Because I don't think you wait to overcome fear to live the life of your dreams or the one that you deserve or to blow your own mind. I personally, and I'm teaching you from my life lessons, from what I've studied, what I've applied, what I've implemented, what I've fallen from, what I've soared from, what I've gotten up from. And I don't think you focus on learning how to overcome fear, though there are things that helps to mitigate your fear. Information mitigates fear. Training and developing your skill set mitigates fear. I teach speaking. I love teaching people how to speak powerfully. Not to speak to be great, but to speak to be unforgettable. Whether you're a speaker or whether you're a manager, or whether you're in retails or in network marketing, whatever it is, when you open your mouth, you want to be unforgettable. And people always say, Lisa, how do I overcome the fear of speaking? I say, let's not focus on the fear of speaking because energy grows where energy goes. So let's not focus on overcoming fear. Let's focus on building a muscle that naturally dissolves fear. And that muscle is the muscle of information, the muscle of education, and the muscle of skill set. So if you know more and then you develop the skill set, you won't be as afraid to do that thing that you're talking about. But the other side to that, now I'm going to disrupt you a bit. So the first part, not so disruptive. That means go get more information. Give fear what fear needs to, 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 to reduce itself, meaning information skill set. But this other part that I'm gonna tell you, this might be disruptive. How about you not try to mitigate, resolve, or get past, or overcome, whatever you wanna call it. How about you not try to do that with fear? How about you allow the fear to sit with you? You just commit to keep moving, even with the fear. So many times in my life and in my career, I was afraid. The difference between me and most is that I still move forward with the fear. Fear does not have a pass to stop you. Fear does not have a pass to stop you. First of all, let me just tell you this. Just like compassion, just like love, just like respect, just like any other feeling you feel for someone, fear is just a feeling. We just give fear more power. We say, when compassion comes, I hug, I love. When understanding comes, when joy comes, when humor comes, I laugh. But when fear comes, I get to stop. What if you change the meaning to that? Ooh, just, just stick with me right here. What if you change your dance with fear? What if you tell fear, you're welcome in my life because you're gonna come. Can't keep you away. But when you come, I'm not going to stop. 
Every single thing you touch is impacted by your story. As an attorney, as a teacher, as an architect, there is not one line of business that you can be in that a story and a great story won't elevate your outcome. Every single line of business, every single line of service that you're connected to will be impacted and ideally elevated by the level in which you're willing to tell and share your story. So let me give you some guidelines, some parameters, what I like to call the bumper rails, as if you're going bowling. You know, when I go bowling, I ask them to put the little bumper rails down so I can stay, my, my ball can get down the lane. So let me set up some bumper rails for you um, so that you understand what makes a great story. So one is the willingness to take risk. Most people, Vision, when they're telling a story, they don't want to take a risk. So the story has, it has its limits on how high it'll go or how deep it'll go. And when you have that, then you're really not at that part that's going to touch my soul. So being willing to take a risk, being clear and concise with your stories. A great story is a show me story, not a tell me story. Now, this is the distinction that's the game changer for most. Most people are telling a story. They say, um, so let me just share with you a little bit of my story and I'll tell you and then I'll show you. So as I was building my life, um, there was a time in my life that was very difficult. It was very challenging. True story. Very difficult, very challenging, very uncomfortable. I didn't have a lot of money. Um, I didn't have a lot of hope and things just looked dismal. At some point, I had to turn my life around. At some point, I made the decision that life had to get better. I'm telling you that. It was decent. You learn about me. Then if I were to show you that story, I would say six days a week, I had to eat beanies and weenies. I had to find money in the crevices and the corners of my couch so that I can get my son milk. There were times when my heart would beat fast just at what am I going to have tomorrow? At some point, I got sick and tired of my own story. Is this going to be my future? No, I can't handle it. Notice the difference in that second story. Wow. I completely see that. I just painted a picture. Same story. Mm -hmm. Now, the second one, when you show a story, it's going to require more of you. It's going to require you to find the colors. What were you thinking? What were you experiencing? What was going on in your head? Instead of telling me you look for money, turn and point. Now, this is anywhere. This is anywhere you are doing anything. I promise you, you become a great storyteller and you will captivate your audience no matter what you're doing. I've captivated investors. I've captivated students. I've captivated educators because I was willing to show the story. I call it unpacking the story vision, being willing to tell me what were you thinking? What were you feeling? What were you seeing? Think about a story as an oral movie. And so in an oral movie, think when you're looking at a movie, the first thing they do is they identify what state of time it is. Is it futuristic? Is it in the now? Was it back in the day? You notice that based on what people are wearing, how they're talking. So paint that picture for me. Take me to that environment. Set the backdrop up for me. Show me what you're going through. Instead of saying I was angry, you can tell me you're angry. But when you say the hair on the back of my neck was standing up, I felt the fumes exiting my nose. I thought that my chest was going to pop and I was going to say something that I'd regret forever. Ooh, you just showed me you were angry. Take that extra time to unpack it. Why will most people not do that? Because it requires a level of vulnerability that we're not willing to share. You know, when you want to learn how to trust your intuition more, you know, I say, and this is me and my walk and my, my belief system, that your intuition is your internal GPS system, your internal God placement system. It's that whisper, and sometimes it's that scream that tells you to leap or to be still. Your intuition is a combination of spirit, emotion, and logic, and it's guiding you. And so often we don't hear our intuition. Why don't we hear it? Because we're having too much chatter in our head. Like the chatter in our head, doubt, worry, judgment, oh my God, judgment, or fear, fear of other people's perception of you. So your intuition is saying, I love to dance. I want to dance. I want to sing. Your intuition is saying, we can have a great time. Your intuition is saying, I want love. Your intuition is saying, gosh, let's go take that chance on that writing that book or let's take that chance on starting that business. And then your chatter comes in. No, what if I fail? So let me explain this to you. Your mind, your brain is designed to keep you safe. 
It's designed and it only has the ability to go back in time in the mental file cabinet and look at the last time you tried something like this and it may not have been um, good or it may have ended in some dangerous situations uh, where people could judge you and your brain is designed to protect you. That's it, your brain's designed to protect you. It's logical. Your intuition is that spark of passion. It's that spark of desire. It's that spark of love. It's that spark of pull me forward. It's that little bit of radical. It's that lot of bit of, uh, um, of, of I want to leave my fingerprint on this planet. Your brain isn't designed to have those same ideas now. Now, your intuition can kick the brain in and the brain can start thinking of ways too, but the intuition is where it's going to start. It's in your gut. It's, in your, it's why when you feel something, you kind of go here. You don't go, oh, I feel so special. You don't say I feel special here. You say I feel it here. I feel it here. And so your job is not to turn down the doubt. Your job is to turn up the passion. It's to turn up the faith. It's to turn up the possibility. Now, still, make well thought out plans. I always say the best plan is the plan made. I don't care if you have to upgrade it, you have to modify it, but if you, if you, if you, if you fail to plan, then you plan to fail. So every dream, every passion, every desire, follow it with a plan, because that's where your brain gets excited. Your brain goes, yeah, we got a plan now. Now you can believe yourself. See, you set big goals and dreams and you have desires and then you don't achieve it, but you don't achieve it because you didn't set the plan in place. You didn't do the details and then you stop believing you could do it. And then you do the biggest tragedy. You stop dreaming. You stop hoping. You stop stretching yourself. You stop listening to your GPS, your God placement system that says you've been put here on a divine assignment and your assignment may change over years. Guess what, your assignment you had 15 years ago may be very different from the assignment on your life today. Your job is to turn down the volume in your head. The volume of judgment, the volume of fear, the volume of worry, the volume of um, perfection. Turn down the volume in your head and turn up the volume in your intuition, in your solar plex in that God placement system, in that heart space. Turn up the volume in that place that just says, what do I want? What? Ask yourself this tonight, today, tomorrow. What feels good to my soul? And then be still and be quiet. I get asked the question a lot, how do I jump start again when I've been complacent? You know, I, I found that I had to ask myself this question as well. For so many years, I was working hard to feed Jelani. I was working hard to give him an equal chance. I had this goal that by the time he was 18, I would have transformed our lives. And I ran hard for it and I worked hard for it. And by the time he was 18, our lives were completely transformed and barely recognizable. And I found that I had slowed down a bit, still running, but running at about 70%. And the challenge that you have to watch out for is that your 70% could be someone else's 115% because you are such a game changer. So you can impress a lot of people never playing full out. And you can look up and a year has passed, three years has passed, five years have passed, and you haven't played full out for a while because you've already achieved a lot by some people's standards. But there's still so much more that you can do. I wanna coach you in this way. Dream a dream or set a goal that's big enough to make you get nervous. Oftentimes, if you're not setting a goal that's beyond three years out in front of you, there's not enough to run for. So I want you to look at your goals. Can you achieve them in a year, two years? I want you to set a goal for three years, set a goal for five years, and set a goal for 10 years. Yes, I said 10 years. When I did this phenomenal program called Lifebook, they had me set 10 year goals and I was so uncomfortable. I sat there silent for a moment. I hadn't thought 10 years out about my life. But if you go out far enough, 10, five, three, then all of a sudden you're playing for something so much bigger. And then set a goal that makes your knees knock and your teeth chatter a bit. If you know how to get to your goal, you're not dreaming big enough. Now the goal also has to be realistic. So it has to be realistic, something you can do if you're currently making 80,000, then your goal in three years isn't to make 500,000 unless you have a path that's viable to get you there, that's real. 
the thing that's really important to remember about a goal is that if you set lofty goals that you will never hit because they're not realistic in the first place, you have to set realistic goals. It's not doesn't mean you're not capable, doesn't mean that you don't believe in yourself, but realistic goals. If you set a bunch of unrealistic goals and you don't hit them, every time you don't hit a goal, you, you lose just a little bit of hope in yourself, a little bit of faith in yourself. And then what happens is you look up five years, 10 years from now, and you're not dreaming anymore. You're not setting goals anymore. You're afraid to tell anyone. So set a goal that makes your knees knock and your teeth chatter a bit. Set a goal that's three years out in front of you. Set one that's five years and set one that's 10 years. As a matter of fact, set several in all those timelines. And then hook your caboose to the train of other people who are running as fast as you are. Surround yourself in a community that inspires you to want to stand on your tippy toes. They inspire you because they're doing so much. Now they believe in values, they believe in faith, they believe in family, but they also believe in running hard, playing hard, and living big. Because if you're the biggest fish in your community, then that's okay. You just need to get a second community to play inside of as well. And so if you find yourself going, hold on, I've become complacent. Walk out 15 years and go, do I want to look back in 15 years and this was the best that I did? The answer probably is no. We spend so much time and energy trying to prevent ourselves from falling. We spend so much energy trying to prevent a failure. We spend so much energy making sure we're safe. And if we spent 70% of that energy exploring how we can soar, exploring how we can play bigger, exploring how we can make memories that we absolutely will be excited to tell when we're 85 years old sitting in our favorite rocking chair. If we spent 40%, 50% of that same energy, how would our lives look differently? I'm not saying be reckless. I'm not saying do it without a plan. What I am saying is so many times I get the question, how do I prevent failure? And I'd love for you to spend that same energy going, how could I ensure that I soar? How can I ensure that I live the life that I want to tell people about? That I write the story that's gonna be really, really good to read. So number one is shift your energy on what you wanna create versus what you wanna prevent. Cause energy grows where energy goes. If you've looked at several episodes, you've probably heard me say that before, not because I've run out of content, but because I wanna keep saying it. Cause repetition is not the mother and father of learning. Repetition is the mother, father, sister, brother, aunt and uncle, and second cousin of learning. So I'm gonna keep telling you this, that energy grows where energy goes. So while we wanna mitigate and reduce our risk of falling, reduce our risk of failure, we wanna spend our dominant energy on creating possibility and what we wanna to run toward. Now I say that, I say that from lessons learned, not just as a teacher, but because I, for many years in the early part of my career, unbeknownst to me, unconsciously, I wasn't running toward possibility. I was trying to outrun $11.42 in the bank like I had in 1994. And so I know that once I was able to get far enough away from that experience, I started losing motivation. I, I stopped running as fast. I didn't know it. I didn't know why. It was because I knew I wasn't threatened by ever seeing $11.42 again. And then I'd run, all my motivation was gone. I was nervous for about a year. I was still in motion, still you know, generating a lot of business, a lot of buzz, but internally, I wasn't driven the same way until I shifted my energy and said, what am I running toward? The first answer was, I don't know, because I've been trying to outrun something so long that I wasn't looking forward, really looking for it, like horizon for it, like up for it. I may have been looking at the next goal for it, the next target for it, but I wasn't looking at horizon, something so big, it would take me 10 years to get there. It would take me 15 years to get there. And so number one, let's create a big bodacious, like yummy in five years, I wanna be here, in 10 years, I wanna have this. Let's create something to run toward that makes your knees knock a bit and it stretches you, it doesn't stress you, it stretches you. I love the phrase willpower, but willpower isn't something you conjure up. Willpower isn't something you drink. Willpower isn't something you download from Google. What you're talking about is how do I make the choices? 
that are in alignment with my highest purpose and my highest vision for myself. That's what you really want to ask. See, your life is a physical manifestation of the choices that you made up until this moment. I'm going to say that again because that gets a little deep. And that can go over some people's head. That can hit you sometimes right between the eyes. And you got to hear it a second time. So here it goes. Your life right now, as it exists today, your finances, your weight, your relationships, your career, your self-esteem, your self-image, your spiritual awareness, all of that is a result of the choices that you've made up until this moment, big and small. And just so you know, your life, the way it appears today, is not a result of a few big choices. Even though that's the thing that we look back on, we go, ah, oh, I shouldn't have moved out of the state. Ah, oh, I shouldn't have got into that relationship. Ah, oh, I shouldn't have. We look at the big things. Well, I'm here to disrupt that mindset a bit. Your life experience right now is not so much a result of your big choices, why those impact you. It's really a result of a bunch of small little choices made consistently over a long period of time. Because those are the habits and the behaviors that you've gotten into. So we can talk about willpower and how do I build willpower as if it's something that you can flex in the gym or something you can do crunches or abs or triceps and build, but it's not. The question you should ask, the answer you should be seeking is what does it take to make my choices become in alignment with the life that I say I wanna live. Now when you say choices, it makes it really sobering because even when you choose to sit down on yourself, it was a choice. So I ask you in this moment, what will it take you to decide to make the choice today? Don't even think about tomorrow, don't think about next week, but to make the choice today that's in alignment with your health goals. Make a choice today that's in alignment with your financial goals. It's the small things. It's the extra visit to Starbucks. It's the extra biscuit. It's the getting up early. It's 10 more crunches. It's doing squats every time you go to the bathroom. At least that's what I do. I do 10. I do 10 every time I go to the restroom. I'm already there. I'm just going to keep on going just because I want to stay in alignment with my goal. And my goal is to have a body that at least creates a double take or or a triple take, maybe. I don't know. I wanted to create a body that is in alignment with my goal. I want to be able to go paintballing with my nephews and my son the way I just did recently. I want to be able to go jet skiing. So when I look at my life and my lifestyle that I want to maintain, it requires me to hike a little longer. It requires me to eat more vegetables and protein. It requires me, my, my choice of how I want to live requires my alignment in what I put in my body or how I stay active in my body. So when I date, I don't, I don't do dinner dates. I'm not interested in doing dinner dates. You wanna date me? Let's go on a hike. Let's go skating, ice skating, roller skating. Let's go on a walk. I, I want active dates in my dating experience because that's in alignment with my life's purpose. So, what are you choosing? Let's not even look at willpower. Let's look at choices. Because choice is something you can control in every single moment. And the choice you made yesterday, if it wasn't alignment with your greatest goal and your highest purpose, okay, yesterday is yesterday. Make a new choice today. You're not ever condemned or sentenced to making the same choice over and over and over again. Every day, every moment, you have a new opportunity to make a new choice. You know, so many people look at uh, fear or even doubt, but they look at fear as if it's the emotional enemy, you know, it's the enemy emotion. Like, oh, I can deal with compassion, I can deal with love, I can deal with understanding, but when fear comes, oh my God, bad thing. No, first of all, change your relationship to fear. I've said this before. Fear is not the enemy. The feeling of fear is just like any other emotion. Fear is actually informing you. Fear is telling you that you need to do something. Either do more research, get some support, get some insight, study a little more, slow down. Fear is actually feeding you. So then ask yourself the question, what do I need to do, think, or go get to dissipate this fear? Because remember, fear is fear becomes present when you've made up something that could happen in the future. And it makes you afraid right now. Like, oh my God, I'm afraid I can get hurt in this relationship. Oh my God, I'm afraid I'm gonna lose my money. You're just projecting a story that you made up. Then back into that fear and go, okay, wait. Then what do I need to do 
to minimize the fear that I might get hurt? What do I need to do to minimize the fear that I might lose my money? What do I need to do? Of course, you can't 100% eliminate the possibility, but you can greatly reduce the chances by asking, what am I afraid of? What am I afraid that's gonna happen? And then secondly, recognize that fear doesn't mean stop. People think, oh, I'm afraid, let me stop. Okay, that's a choice to stop. Fear doesn't necessarily mean stop. Fear might mean proceed with caution or proceed with more strategy. Fear doesn't, whenever I'm feeling fear, it doesn't tell me, I don't even think now to stop with the fear. I do think to slow down, go get some help, go get some insight, voice my fear so that it's not just all in my head. Recognize that Fear is going to come in when you're playing bigger than you've ever played before. I, I say if your knees aren't knocking and your teeth aren't chattering, just a little at least, then you're not playing big enough. The bigger you play, the more you're going to feel your knees knock and you're going to hear your teeth chatter. And I'm always playing big. I'm always feeling my knees knock and I'm always hearing my teeth chatter. But I've created a relationship with that fear to go, hold on. Let's say fear is right here. Fear. What are you telling me? Because fear really is, it's, it's a story. It's, it's something you think could happen. And could it happen? Yeah. But could it not happen? Yeah. So don't try to outrun fear. Don't try to outrun doubt. And definitely don't wait until doubt and fear are gone before you move. Find out what doubt and fear needs to dissipate into the nothingness that it always was. What does it need? And then understand that action brings clarity. So the more you move forward, the more action you're in, the more clarity you get because action breeds clarity. And clarity comes with action. So many times you're sitting on the sideline waiting, waiting to get completely clear before you take any action. And clarity is waiting for you to get in action to create clarity. So be willing. Be willing to play full out a little nervous. If you want another awesome video in our Black Excellence series, check out the video right there next to me. I think you'll enjoy it. Continue to believe, and I'll see you there.